to know more about. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So they are not, they, they, they want to hear so that they might learn new things, gain more information, but not grow in the, not grow in Christ, grow in faith, not grow in spirit. That is not what they're looking for. They just want to be able to argue, have talking points, be able to talk on the hill, uh, talk at Mars Hill, talk to Arab Hobbes, talk at the Parthenon, talk, talk at the Agora, wherever they are, to pontificate about this great thing, this new thing, rather, that they have heard about. And then they can say, look what I know and you don't know, right? So they, they want it in their arsenal just so they can advance their own self-righteousness. Uh, verse number two. I mean, verse number 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too, you are also superstitious. What is Paul, how did Paul approach him about to tell them about the gospel? How does he approach it? Right. Paul don't go out and say, you going to hell because you don't know Jesus. Um, Deacon Andrews, is that how we do evangelism? <laughs> because if you start off the conversation when I'm going to hell, I, well, I'm going to hell. There's not even a reason for me to continue the conversation. He meets them where they are. He recognizes a strength that what they believe is a strength in this world, right? He recognizes that they, you know, you all are men of Athens. I perceive that in all things you are superstitious. He 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 tries to appeal to their ego, but he has a he has a much deeper reason for why he's doing this, right? He's not doing it just to make them feel good, but he's meeting them where they are because he's going to present to them something that, that, that he wants them to receive, and it's that special, and he wants them to know, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to come down on your level. You know, Paul is the one who says, I become all things for all people. Sister Thompson. Mine does too. So King James says superstitious. This uh, Eagle Sanders says religious. Yes, this is a. I believe this is a King James version. Yes. Yeah. So King James says superstitious. Mine says religious in American, not American, in English Standard Version. Right. So he read you all. Listen, I see your temples. I see the the the, the homage you pay to all the God small G. I see that you all are intellectual. So I'm not going to take any of that away from you. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add that to my arsenal to share with you a gospel about something that you don't know anything about. And he, he meets them culturally. And it is important. So I'm an educator. This is something an educator. Um, we talk about cultural competencies in education, right? Because uh, we tired of reading C, C, J, run, J, run fast, run, J, run, right? J Dick and J books were little white kids with Mary J shoes on, and they were, they were white kids, right? So we talk about cultural competencies in education. You're talking about having texts and curriculums from a myriad of, uh, of diverse places, Hispanic, African American, Latino, Right, um, Asian American, right? You don't want just to have this monolithic uh, educational or monolithic uh, 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 book that only appeals to one set of people. Paul recognizes that he differentiates. He differentiates the entire lesson plan so that they can have this understanding that I can meet you where you at because what you have in your culture can be brought into Christianity too. With some, 
with, with, with some parameters around it. But if you're important and your personhood is important. He's not asking them to divorce themselves from their culture in as much as he's asking them, you can accept this Jesus the Christ and he will transform you and you can bring some of your culture into it with you. Right? That is important. That he does not, he does not down them for who they are. But as I pass and listen to what he says, he, he, he's been there, he's preached there. Uh, my English Standard Version said, verse number 26, uh, for as I passed along, and observe the objects of your worship. I also found an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown. This I proclaim to you. So the Greeks had gods. Known gods. Mm -hmm. Gods for centuries. For generations. That was verse 23. Yes. You said 26. Oh I'm sorry. It was 23. It was 23 in my version. I'm sorry. It was, it was 23. Uh, he so he he hears them. He says, "You you you know God. You polytheistic. Some of you might have a monotheistic, but you also recognize that you don't have the monopoly on all knowledge." And then he says, "For you yourselves have erected this entire this entire." An altar, place of worship. You, you erected and you said to the un unknown God. Now what Paul could have gone myriad of ways with the unknown God? Who was the unknown God that Paul was going to talk about? Here? Jesus. How do we know that? Because we read the rest of the chapter. Okay, we read the rest of the chapter. <laughs> and and what is what is Paul's primary focus in sharing the gospel? What is it? Salvation. The salvation. The simplistic, the simplicity of the gospel. Jesus was born, he died, and he rose for your sin. Amen. And all you have to do is accept him. Right. And it is not a work salvation, and it's this, this, this very scandalous word called grace that will save everybody and that's the unknown God that you do not know about you know Athena you know Diana you know Persephone you know Hermes you know Hermes you know all of these all of these gods small g but there is a God again he's building his Christology around there is a God that you do not know about, and that God it can transform your entire life. Because Sister um, Kim Smith, what did what did the the people say about Jason and them when they was out in the, I think they were in Thessalonica? They were doing what? You remember? You you said the last time they were doing something with the word. And turning the world upside down. The, the, the man in which I have been beaten, kicked out of four or five cities, the man in which I have been preaching, the man in which I have I have been going to the synagogues to tell the Jews about, that I have been at the Agora, which is the marketplace. This man whom they say I'm turning the world upside down, he will turn this unknown God to you will turn your world upside down and will transform you. And then verse number 24. He says, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. So he's selling them. <laughs> that, man, what is this? He's like, okay, yeah, you know, bring along your whole stuff. But then he's like, you, you're worshiping this God and you don't know who this God is. But I do. So let me share him with you. As people of faith, we are called to be evangelists. Mm -hmm. And in being an evangelist, we are called to share our faith. And in sharing our faith, we're simply sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Do you know who Jesus is? Simple question. Have you accepted him? It is, listen, all we do is simply present the gospel. We are not, we simply go fishing with the gospel. And guess what? Who does, who does the convicting? The Holy Spirit is the only one that can convict them. Amen. We simply, what do we do, Deacon, Deacon um, Andrews? We plant the seed. We simply plant a seed. And you don't know how that planted seed is going to come forth. Now, it don't mean that it's going to happen right now. It doesn't mean that you're sharing the gospel with someone. It means they're going to come running like the Philippian jail and his family. What must I do to be saved right now? But it can plant a seed. And that seed can continue to be nurtured by the Holy Spirit. And that seed can continue to grow in the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. And can convict them, and then maybe 20 years later, Amen. they can come. I remember somebody just simply told me about, about a man named Jesus. And I've tried everything. That's what he tells them in Abbott. You, you, you know all these other guys, but this, this one you're worshiping ignorantly. You don't know him, so let me teach him to you. And us simply sharing, this is why it is so important for us to share the gospel. It is so important for us to share the good news because in the end, and I say this so often and it's so true, it doesn't matter what you amass in this world. If you Amen. do not know Jesus, you will die and go to hell. And that's why he's sharing the gospel. He says, y'all worship this, uh, this God ignorantly. You don't know. But let me teach you who he is. And he says, verse number 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Mm -hmm. this, is his, 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 this is theology about God, but this is also Christology about Christ. He makes it clear. You all think that the brick and mortar is where the deity resides, right? Right? You all think that it's in the physicality. And he's like, let me tell you about the God of creation. Mm -hmm. Let me tell. He taps into his Jewish roots to go back to Genesis. Amen. The God of creation. In the beginning, the world was dark and void. And God's face hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. He went back to the creation narrative to get them to have an understanding in a very, very simplistic way. That you have buildings, God, the, God, the unknown God that you worship that I'm going to tell you about, he does not dwell in temple. How would that um, clash with his understanding of being a Jew? God don't dwell in temples. How would that clash with his understanding of being a Jew? How? Well, God's presence was in the Holy of Holies. Oh. God's presence was where? In the church in the Ark of the Covenant. God. Okay. God led Israel with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Right? He's, he, goes, he, he goes out before them, right? You know, when they marched out, they're supposed to say, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Because God is going out before them, right? And he dwells in the sacred space in the temple, the Holy of Holies. You know that. And only person that can go in the Holy of Holies was who? The high priest. It's a high priest because only one holy of holies. He only can go in a certain time. And what did he? He had to have all these things on him in case he dropped dead because he didn't get it, wasn't clean or whatever. Um, 
when they get to the holy land, right, or when they get to the promised land, God continues to dwell in the tent. And th then David, what was the symbol? It was a symbol of God that was in the holy of holies. The Ark, the the Ark of the Covenant, a symbol of God was in the Holy of Holies, right? And that, that, that represented God, right? So David wanted to build God a temple. God told David, no, Solomon builds him a temple. They have these this big temple. So, so the Jews would have had an understanding of God dwelling where? In a temple. In a temple. Why? How do you know? Now let me do some cultural stuff on, on us to die. So, in Genesis, you had two places where God name would have dwelled. Shiloh and Bethel. House of God. Shiloh and Bethel. House of God. Go to Shiloh, go Bethel, house of God. Now, this is the cultural thing. In America, up north, you have a Shiloh and a Bethel or Bethel in most northern cities. Those churches are, the Bethels are generally Methodist, AME, AME Zion. That's what they usually are. The Shilohs are usually Baptist. Shiloh Baptist Church. Why? Why is that the case? Because slaves, when they were running away, they would tell them to go to the house of God. And the house of God is known as what? House of prayer. House of prayer, but I just gave you the two names. Oh, yeah. Shiloh yeah. and Bethel. So that's your cultural thing for the night. Um, but back to the text. So they would have had an understanding that God, Jews would have had an understanding that God dwells in the temple. Here is Paul again being radical, again moving beyond those three T's, the Talmud, the tradition, the temple, and getting and teaching these Grecians another understanding about God and God not dwelling in Temples, but where does God dwell now? In the people. What did you say, Sister Tom? In the hearts of men. He's pushing them to look beyond what they know. He's pushing them to, to look beyond the status quo. He's pushing them to think radically, to think outside the box. And he wants them to know that this God, whom you, whom you do not know, who you worship ignorantly, does not live in temples, and, but he is the creator of all things. That is the God in which he tells them, I want you to know God. Uh, yes. Their worship, so they, they already had an altar for the unknown God. Amen. So their wor they worship this unknown God as a God. There might be another God out there that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were covering all their bases. Right. Oh. Because you're not going to catch us lacking. I see. Because we know that we might not have it all figured out. Yeah. So for the God that we don't know, okay. let's. Let me know more about them. Okay, about them. I knew they built, I always thought it was like a monument, but I just thought they just built it and went on their way. But <laughs> this is expanding my understanding. Yeah, they, they built it, they probably were worshiping this God that they didn't know. We 
we don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. We bring a, a, a sacrifice to the altar however many times a year simply because there might be another God. Mm -hmm. uh, verse number 25. The Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man. He does not live in temples made by man. He lives in the heart of men. Um, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Mm -hmm. Wow. Your gods, you all have to piecemeal together all of these different gods, Greek people, in order to have a semblance of the God that encompasses everything. You remember um, Old Testament. They have several, several got Baal, Ashtaroth. And I believe it was in the temple of Dagnon. It might have been Ashtaroth. Yeah, D-A-G-N-O-N. Yeah. And the Ark of the Covenant was taken in there. Right. And they made, and, and, and they, they, the, the, um, the, the, the God, small g, ends up bowing to it. They set it back up. And guess what happened the next time? It fell and breaks. Why? Because all of these small g gods, you have to put them together. It's in the book of Psalms. I can't remember which one, but God is indicting Israel and telling them that they they picking out all these gods that are made out of wood and out of stone and out of metals. He was like, hey, none of these gods do nothing for you. I am, I am the Lord our God. And this is what Paul is telling them. He's telling them that all these small little gods that you have, you have to put all of them together to make them a quarter of the God that is the Lord our God. He does. He is not served by human hands, uh, as as though he has needed anything, since he himself gives to all humankind life, breath, and everything. He he is the giver of life. He is the the one who gives us meaning. He, it's not us, it's him. And he made from one man. Every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places. Who's the one man he created? Adam, the loved son of God. He, he creates Adam, and from Adam, you get all of these people on the earth. Right? And he says, Having determined the allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places, what is he saying there? What is he saying there? Okay, what else? start at 6, we end at 7, beginning and ending, right? You know, we see things in a very linear way. Um, God does not live in those boxes. I try to get people, I try so hard to get people to understand. When they try to indict God on where was God during mid Atlantic slave trade, God was where God always has been. Where God is. God does not, is not under the law. God is not under our morals and ethics. Where there is moral and where there is ethics, God is above it. Now, God might give you some stuff you got to do, but he's giving it to you. He's giving it to us. God didn't give us the Bible so that we can keep him in check. God gives us the Bible so we can keep us in check. Right. Right. 
God is above. And we, we sometimes we forget that part. Which is why when Deacon Andrews prays, he always says he's a what God? <laughs> what do you say about God? He's a sovereign God. Yes. And when you're talking about sovereignty, sovereignty is above. Right? And this God who is sovereign created you. This God who is sovereign created time and space for people to dwell in. He created periods and times. And so when people get to talking about science and God cannot exist, I, I beg to differ. Because God made all of these. Y'all came up with some different names for it. God created all of this and in his grand scheme and design. He created all of these things in a certain time, a certain era. I, he knew what needed to happen, when it needed to happen, in order for the timeline to be where the timeline had to be. That is the sovereignty of God. And that is what Paul is getting them to try to understand. This unknown God that you have been worshiping and you did not know, he is above all of this sovereign. He gives breath. He takes care of people. He's the one that created man out of one, out of, out of dust, breathed into him a living soul, and that man began to procreate. That is what he's getting them to understand. The boundaries of their dwelling place. And they, and they, verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him. And find him, yet he is actually not far from each of us, each one of us. Why? For in him we live, move, and have a being. And even some of your own poets have said, but we have we are indeed his offspring. A lot right there. That's verse 27 through 28. He says, God has created, created time, space, and these boundaries, that we should what? Dwell. He says something before dwell. That you should. Seek, yours says feel, seek, right? Abram, and we meet Abram at the end of chapter 11 of Genesis, and he lived in Ur, Chaldea, and he dwelt amongst people who worshiped what? Idols. But Abram, what happened with him? How did he not worship idols? Or how did he pivot from worshiping? What did he do? What happened? He left his father's house. After his father died. That's what happened. Seek. Seek, right? And God salts Abram, right? He salt Abram. And what did Abram do? He followed. He followed. From the very beginning. That they should seek God. Adam had the a totally different relationship with God than anybody else in the sacred text. Literally, he walked with God in the garden. That was, uh, you know, him and God ace, right? That's my dog. He, him and God were just that close, right? That was that was that all. Falls into sin, and what happens? The relationship changes. After the fall of man, the relationship changes. And now God has to see the iniquity of humankind and has to now cover it up with the blood of a sacrifice, right? Relationship changes. But then you see throughout the sacred text people who encounter God. Enoch, right? You know Enoch. Enoch was just a man who walked with God. That's what the text said. And then the text said what? He was no more. For God what? Translated him. Right? He walked with God. Seeking after God. Right? Moses. Y'all you know Moses. And they say, Moses said, uh, God tells uh, uh, Aaron and Miriam, how can you speak against the, the man whom I put in my mouth, my, my words into his mouth? 
I talked to a prophet in, in, um, in parables and so many words. He said, but I talked to Moses face to face, mouth to mouth. Right? Seeking God. Right? And here in this text, he says that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Through who? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit, I was six years old. I was real young. And I just knew I loved God. That, that's, I just knew I loved God. And it was like so real to me as a little kid. I couldn't listen. I didn't know nothing about Christology, theology. <laughs> I ain't know nothing about angelology. I ain't know none of that. All I knew was I love God. And I believe God loves me. I, I don't have the reasoning. I don't have the understanding. But it was the leading and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And with that, I walked with God. I, I accepted him, I walked with him, I walked with him, but you only get to that point by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit convicted him. Uh, he wants the Holy Spirit to feel him. Yet he is actually not far from us. He's not, why is he not far from us? We know he's everywhere. We live and move in that love What you say? What you say? Because he dwells within a Christian. He dwells within us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. He's not far from us because he is where? With us as believers. Where is he? He is in us. Right? He, he is not far from each one of us. Why? Because in him, in God, in Christ, we live, move, and have our being. It is not in any of these other world sources. It is in him, the Lord our God, the God of creation, the God of salvation, the God of consecration that we live, move, and have our being in. He does not just end there. But then he quotes somebody again from their world. But even some of your own poets have said, even people whom you highly esteem recognizes this thing. Recognizes the God of creation. Recognizes the God of salvation. Recognizes that thus all these small gods that you have, there is something that you do not know about. I'm sharing it with you. This poet that you all love to quote, he said, for it, we are indeed his offsprings. Yes, we are his offsprings. And if we are his offsprings, that makes us what? God created us with a mirror in one hand, dust in the other, and sculpted from dust humanity in his image. And what did he say about that image? It was good. It was good. That is the Imago Dei. Created in God's image. And he's trying, and what Paul is doing is appealing to what they know so that they might have a 
understanding about an unknown God named Jesus the Christ. Because it's only in him that we live, move, and have our being. All righty, that is it for this evening. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming on to Bible study tonight. We are glad and grateful for you. You want to, If you want to give to this mission, you can do so. Um, via Cash App, Dallas Side, New Side, it's PBC, PB Church, or Zelle, or PayPal, which is uh, New Side, it's P 